this time to chapter 15, the Gospel of John, and chapter 15, I read from verse 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is he, he withers and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burnt if you abide in me and my words abide in you you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. We are back uh, to think about that Thursday evening, Thursday evening before our Lord Jesus Christ is crucified. Remember that uh, it began in that upper room, the upper room discourse, which was largely to prepare his disciples because uh, of what was to happen. He comforts his disciples about the fact that he is going to leave God, the Holy Spirit, who will be a comforter for them. He will leave peace as they have never known. Peace that the world cannot give. The peace that surpasses human understanding. In the end of chapter 14, we are told, verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father and that the Father has given me, so I do. Those little words or those, that last sentence arise. So it is the end of the upper room discourse. 15 is not, is not spoken from the upper room. 15 looks to me like uh, they have uh, a reason and have... Uh, are on their way to Gethsemane. So it could be a discourse on the way to Gethsemane. On the streets, perhaps the highest street of Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus Christ begins to speak to his disciples. This time he is not comforting them. He is challenging them. He is putting on them a demand. He is uh, speaking to his disciples about union and communion with the Savior Jesus Christ. He is speaking to them about his relationship with them. Their relationship with uh, fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and their relationship with the world. They ought to know and they ought to make sure that they maintain that closer walk with their Savior, Jesus Christ, if they are going to make it. And this is what I want to bring to your attention. It is the essential relationship with Christ, which is from 1 to 8. 
or the union and communion with Christ. This is what I want to spend time as we on as we look through the scriptures. You see, dear friends, it's it, it is an admonition, as I said, to continue with this clause, closer walk, because, because one of the disciples of Jesus has just walked away. One of them has just been cast away or has, has walked away and has not continued. And the reason why our Savior so it fits to make this emphasis, to make this emphasis, an emphasis to all of us, an emphasis to myself, to take heed that we have this close, essential relationship, vital relationship, important relationship that begins in Christ and must continue in Christ. The moment we have known that relationship, that's the end of the game. That's the end of the story. As people say, it's game over. It's game over. Notice firstly, the description of himself, the description of Jesus and his father sets the tone. Jesus describes himself in verse 1. I am the vine, he says. And my father is a vine dresser. Jesus Christ is the true vine. In fact, he says, I am the true vine. This is the seventh time that Jesus is using that little way, or those two words, I am. Remember that he has already said six times. Using those, that little word, or those few, two words, he has already said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will walk, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of this life. He has already said, I am the door of the sheep. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He has already stated, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The good shepherd, Jesus has stated, knows the sheep and the sheep know him. He has already stated, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he says, will live. The Lord Jesus Christ has stated the 60th time he has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> he has already stated that he is the I am. I am he. Remember when he was speaking to his, the Jews? <clears throat> when he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. In the I am's that we have seen, it is very clear that he is manifesting his sufficiency. He is manifesting his, his deity. If he has life in himself, then he must be God. And in our text, the Lord Jesus states, I am the true vine. Not suggesting in any way that he is talking about the fact that there is a false vine. 
he is talking about the wars, uh, what depicted him. He is talking about the shadows and the types. He is contrasting himself with Israel, who was the vine of the Old Testament. Not a sufficient vine, the vine that did not provide what now is provided for all the people of God. I am the true vine is a contrast to the Old Testament. Because Egypt, so Israel is a vine. In Psalm 80, we are told 8 and verse 9, you have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You have prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root. It is filled the land. But this vine did not achieve. When you read your seer, you hear these words, Israel is an empty vine. Israel is not a fruitful vine. Jesus Christ is the fruitful vine. Because those that are connected to him, they will live and they will never perish. Hosea 10 and verse 1 says, Israel is an empty vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embarrassed his sacred pillar. Israel was supposed to be the means by which many, by which the world is blessed. But Israel is unfruitful. In contrast to this, Jesus says in that one statement, I am the true. I am not that shadow. I am not that type of a vine. I am the real vine. Is a vine by which all spiritual blessings flow from. And this is what we want to think as we think about our Savior Jesus Christ. It is like the way scripture states. That he is the last Adam. There was an Adam that fell. But we're also saying he is a true vine because Israel had failed, who was a vine. Our Savior Jesus Christ, in other words, this is his message. Our Savior Jesus Christ is the only source, is the only sufficient source of spiritual life and sustenance. Not Israel. When you belong to Israel, the nation of Israel, you, can, you will perish without Christ. But if you belong to it with Christ, yes, you will not perish. Christ is the only source of life, the only source of spiritual life, the only source of maintaining that spiritual life. But he also states that his father is a vine dresser. The father is the one who tends the branches so that they bear fruit. This is what we are told in verse 1. I am the true vine. My father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He tends and he punishes those that do not bear. That's a description. Jesus Christ is a true vine. Jesus Christ 
is a true vine and the father is a vine dresser the father is a farmer who tends the vine dresser is a farmer who prunes and who cuts and throws things that are encumbrances but second I want you to see the consequence having described I want you to see the consequence of spiritual fruitlessness the consequence of spiritual fruitlessness Jesus states in verse 2 every branch in me that does not bear fruit he categorically states he takes away now uh, before I even proceed I want to give a caution that this is a parable in in the art of interpreting parable is that you don't interpret every part all right because this text has been used to advance the wrong teaching that you see Christians can lose their salvation every branch in Christ you see there are those that are connected vitally connected to Jesus Christ but they can lose their salvation no no the what is the message of the whole parable it's union and communion so what is he stating here? He is saying the mark of false profession. Those who force, those who profess faith and yet have no fruit, that is a mark of false profession. And it is these that the Lord will take away. You hear that? There's no loss of salvation. Because you want to in literally interpret what is figurative and what is pictorial. Those who profess faith and yet have no fruit are like the branches on the vine that do not bear fruit lack of fruit lack of spiritual fruit is a clear proof that there is no spiritual life in you You see, friends, do not worry whether the so-called man of God says, you have now become a Christian. Ignore him. Focus on whether there is any change that has, that has happened after he has declared you Christian. If there is no fruit, it doesn't matter whether your, your testimony is five pages. Whether your testimony, every one of us will be crying as we hear it. Every one of us will be shaking our heads. If there is no fruit in your life, spiritual fruit in your life, the Lord is saying that profession of yours is false. And consequently, Consequently, you will be met with destruction, fruitlessness has a damning consequence, destruction. Destruction. And you see, that is when you hear the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. That's, that's the only thing that distinguishes those two seeds or the seeds 
that fell on the path, the rocky ground and thorny ground. There are only two distinctions there. If you look closely, it's fruit. Those that do not bear fruit. The Lord is saying, the Father is a vine dresser. Those who profess and say that they, they, are, they have a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. Those who say they have faith in Jesus Christ and they have a relationship. They are connected to him by faith and yet do not have spiritual fruit. The Lord will cut them off. In other words, verse 6 gives us a clear explanation. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. The unfruitful professor of faith will be cast in the lake of fire. Now this is this is this is very scary. Because not all who say Lord Lord will enter the kingdom. He who does the will of the Father is the fruit of the same. All those who have no fruit of holiness, fruit of godliness, the love of God, service of God, the love of others, saving others, Lord is clear, he will throw them in the lake of fire. But thirdly, which is the opposite, the result of spiritual fruitness or the result of fruitfulness in verse 2b, we are told, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You, he says to his disciples, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The result of spiritual fruitfulness. Yet those who profess faith and are fruitful, the Lord will prune the Lord will cut, but the cutting is for production. It's for much fruit. In other words, the Lord is saying, this is what the Lord is saying, the pruning there, which is the cutting of the, the excess branches, the, 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 the branches that are dying off, or the branches uh, that uh, are an encumbrance on, on the bearing of fruit, the Lord will page away. Or it is the word that we use in theology, the Lord will sanctify. <coughs> he is talking about sanctification. Those who have Christian fruits, the Lord will continue to grow so that you bear even more fruit. So this fruit that we are talking about is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, righteousness, holiness, godliness, and truth. 
are some of them that will be very clear in our lives. The result of spiritual fruitfulness is firstly that those who profess faith and are bearing fruit are true believers, are true Christians. And these will bear even the more fruit because that's what the Lord clearly tells us. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that they may bear more fruit, he says. He states it in verse 11, in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who, bears, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. He will bear fruit a hundredfold. He will bear fruit 60-fold. He will bear fruit 30-fold. The point is that professing Christians have fruit. And those that have fruit, the Lord prunes so that they bear much fruit. Like uh, the farmer who wants the, the, the vine, the grape vine to flourish the grape vine to rejuvenate the grape vine he cuts all the excesses so that there is the bearing of fruit now as i said the, this is very clear that he's talking about uh, our cleansing our ongoing cleansing or sanctification so that we are holy vessels <coughs> in the hands of God for his use. In the hands of God for his use. The Lord primarily, the Lord primarily uses his word in conjunction sometimes with various suffering to make sure that he perfects the believer to make sure that the believer grows in holiness. To make sure that the believer grows in loving God, in saving God. It is the word of God. And is, as I said, in conjunction with various trials and suffering. Sometimes. Listen to his words here. He says in verse 3, you are already, are already cleansed. With what? Because of the word. In chapter 17, verse 17, he says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is that's the means. That's the means by which he will prune. Like I said, in conjunction with various trials, various hatchets, the, the Lord removes the excess loads that slows those that are bearing fruit. Fruit is there. But they can bear even more fruit. The Lord uses, uh, removes those excesses that are hindering their progress. If the Lord speaks and you are not getting him, he speaks again, you are not getting him. In his wisdom, in his sovereignty, he brings things that will make us alert. When the church is not going to reach out, we are told in Jerusalem, when he told them that they should go out starting from Jerusalem and to the ends of the world, and they are still in Jerusalem, he brings persecution.
perhaps the Lord brought COVID as a means of that pruning. For some, that pruning is death. For some, it's growth. Loving to cherish the family of God. In those moments when we were separated and you want to interact and there is no contact fellowship in that sense. Maybe the Lord, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it was because, I'm saying maybe. For some it meant nothing. Because even in the first place they have no fruit by which to be pruned. For them it was death. In fact, there was a saying that when COVID came, those who were those who were in out outpatient ward went into the they were admitted as Christians. Those who were already admitted as patients, spiritual patients. They went to, into ICU. And those who were in ICU, you know what happened. They are gone. They have spiritually died. Because in the first place, their profession was false. The Lord sometimes may be very drastic. He sometimes takes those things we cherish most. Even our own spouses. Even our own jobs. Even our children. He may take away your health. Just to, if you are a Christian, and I'm saying you are a Christian, if you are not a Christian, you are a legitimate child. He will not bother. He, that suffering is meant to actually kill. That's what Hebrews tells us in, in chapter 12. legitimate children he will not discipline he will not prune that is why the old divines when they visited somebody who was sick in hospital and they themselves have been well for for days on end for years and he has never suffered anything he would he will desire oh that it was me in that bed because far, friends, you have been counted worthy of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is for your good. And that's not our outlook, isn't it? That's not our outlook. Our outlook is that we must all be well until we die throughout our lifetime. Don't take it as a blessing. Well, it may be a blessing. It may be that you are Ill illegitimate. He doesn't bother. The Lord uses his words in conjunction with various suffering. When we suffer and we do not see it from God's word, that suffering doesn't do anything. It is either, oh, God hates me. It is, we are praying for that moment when it will be done so that we are back to square one, back to the wallows of this life. Suffering is meant to refine a believer. 
in conjunction with God's word, as we think through what dross is the Lord removing. He prunes that we may bear more fruit, that we may bear much fruit. And he tells them, as he applies this truth to his own disciples, to the 11 disciples, in chapter 3, he seems to be saying that as for them, as for the 11, he was very sure that they were genuine believers. Because these believers were already sanctified in the Lord, cleansed in the Lord. But he knew one of them who has gone away from them, Judas Iscariot, was not clean. Therefore he says, as for you, even if I'm talking like this, you are already clean because, you're, because of the word which I have spoken to you. You the eleven, not Judas Iscariot. But fourthly and lastly, the duty, Christian duty to continue. Christian duty to continue. Continuing that is in the Lord. Verse 4, abide, he says, abide in me, and I in you is, is Christian duty that he demands. Jesus Christ is calling the twelve who have professed faith, who have been united, they have, they have this vital relationship as a vine has with the branch, or as a branch has with the vine, as the branch has the vital relationship with a stem, the branch does not exist on its own. It exists in the stem. Whether it be a mango tree or an orange tree, you do not find a branch on the ground and bearing fruit. That is not possible. Jesus Christ is that vine, like that stem. It is through him that life flows to us. It is through the stem that life flows to the branches, that all the nutrients, all the food flow to the branch. He is telling them, abide in me. That union that you have experienced when you believed in Jesus Christ, that you must remain. You see, friends, when you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were united in Christ. That is what we, he has already said in 14, that I in you and you in me. This is not a new teaching here in verse chapter 15. There's already this vital relationship. That's the reason why you can bear fruit, because you have life. You are connected to Jesus Christ. If it were not so, you would not bear fruit. That relationship, that union, begins at a point when we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus Christ. It's a mystical, sweet union. Because friends, you are like a dead plant, a dead branch. If you do, if you are not connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, a 
And therefore, the duty is that since you are connected, he states to them, continue. Continue remaining in the Lord. That is his demand. That is a Christian duty. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. We need, as Christians, those who are united, those who say are united with Christ in faith. Remember what the Apostle Paul says in chapter 6. Just as he died on the cross, we died with him. Just as he was raised from the dead, we were resurrected with him in this new life that we now live. That's a union I'm talking about. When you believe. He therefore says, now continue in that union. Reason, which leads me to the second. The reason he says that you, you, you continue is several. The first and, first and greatest reason is because of your sustenance. Why he is saying continue, abide in the Lord, continue in that union, because it is clear you cannot sustain yourself. You cannot. Friends, let me state it this way. Christian life is not possible without union with Christ. It's not. The source of life is Christ. Just as the source of life for the branch is the stem. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. One of those few things, few um, passages of Scripture in Ephesians. Let me read Ephesians in chapter 3. Paul says, um, reading at verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, it says Christ may dwell. Oh, as we I read chapter chapter two of Colossians and verse nineteen, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knitted together by joints and ligaments grows in the increase that is in God, or that is from God. not holding fast to the head from whom all the body, which is another illustration that there is, there is uh, this vital relationship between the head and the body. <coughs> Just as there is that vital relationship between the stem and the branches. That nourishment comes because of this connection. That sustenance comes because of this connection. It's very important. The reason he says is because if we are to sustain this life, we need to continue. But thirdly, secondly, sorry, as a way of giving reason why he is making this demand, this Christian demand, 
It is for sustenance, but I've already stated. Secondly, it is for production, for more production. Look at the, 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 the text once again in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who bears, uh, he who abides, he who remains, or he who continues in me, and I in him, he clearly states, bears much fruit. For without me, he says, for without me, you, and I should state, and myself can do nothing. Can do nothing. <clears throat> By the way, I want to state that, uh, you know, such texts must humble ourselves because we as men are very proud. Very few blessings that you do not generate, but generated by God, it is as if you did it yourself. I built it. When we were beginning, we were only three of us. We built it. You, who built it? You or oh, the vine and the vine dresser? The reason why you have more fruit is because of that vital relationship you have with Christ. And what a blessing. Not of ourselves. So the point is to make sure that we are maintaining that close communion with Christ. That's a point that he wants to state to his disciples. When I am gone, yes, few hours from now i will be betrayed there will be a bit of shaking in terms of your faith but remember you have a comforter you have peace in you that i live remember when i am gone that duty that i live with you is to maintain a closer union with myself even when i'm gone Because then he will produce. Until he comes, brethren, this is our duty. Until he comes, is to cultivate this close relationship with Jesus Christ. The means is very clear. If you do it outside God's word, that will not work. He meets us in his word. We become like him in his word. By the help of God, the Holy Spirit, yes. By the help of the brethren who may interpret things for us, yes. But it is essentially his word. Sanctify them by the truth. For your word is truth. But thirdly, the reason he is saying that you have this duty is not just for sustenance. Yes, primarily for sustenance and for production. But thirdly, for prayer, for answered prayer. <coughs> Verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. The means by which I will prune you, abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Tell me why the, the Lord doesn't answer us. Because we pray amiss. We pray without his word, without the revealed word of God. God has promised to answer us, as we saw in the previous chapter. God has promised to answer us only if we maintain this vital relationship. Firstly, is that he will answer those who are united with Christ. And he will answer those who commune with Christ. 
Those who are genuine believers, the Lord will answer. Those who are bearing fruit, the Lord will answer. Those who are having a close fellowship with God, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God will answer. But I must quickly state, as he has put it here, those who are saturated with the word of God, if you abide in me, he states, and my word is in you. If the word of God is not in you, you won't ask according to the will of God. Unless you know the revealed word of God, how are you going to pray? How are you going to pray? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It will be a selfish prayer. Lord, me this. Lord, me that. Even if it is meant for your destruction, it is Lord me that Lord me this. The Lord will not answer. When he answers, sometimes he gives us a way to our own sin and demand so that we learn. How will you know? Unless you know that prayer is always answered. If you don't read God's word, you will not know that prayer is answered always through the mediation of Jesus Christ. That's what we read previous chapter. Whatever you ask in my name, in my name, Jesus would stay. How would you know that your prayer should be prayed or must be prayed to the glory and honor of God? Because that's what we are told in the previous, in the previous chapter. When we pray, for whose glory are we praying? We pray in his name. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. For God's glory. You see, the reason why chapter verse 7 is saying, If you abide in me, and my words, my words that will inform you about how you should pray, they will not be answered prayer. <laughs> Union and communion ensures that there is answered prayer. But uh, fourthly, the reason he is demanding that continuing in the Lord is praise. The praise of God. Listen to the text. By this my Father is glorified. By this my Father is glorified. That you bear much fruit. How would you bear much fruit? Unless you are communing. And lastly. The reason he is stating this. Is proof. It is a proof that you are his disciple. Those who will not continue are uh, the Judas. Listen to verse 8 again. By this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. He's making this as an emphasis. Brethren, those of us who profess faith, this is a sure test. Proof. Well, let me end. I end by stating that this is a warning for all of us. 
Judas Iscariot professed faith. But there was no fruit, no spiritual fruit in his life. It looked like he had fruit, but his life was marred with sin. Life, as we were told last week, of a covetousness. A life of greed. That was Judas' life. We are not saying Judas didn't go to church if there was one. He attended the means of grace. He sat under the Lord Jesus Christ's teaching. He fellowshiped with the twelve. Or is it eleven? With the master. Jesus Christ is stating to us, this is a warning. Like Judas is carried, we must ensure there is fruit. Fruit that is increasing. And if we neglect the means by which we continue, we will not produce, we will not be vessels by which or for which God will use. Let me close by stating that unless we have a vital relationship with Jesus Christ, there will be no life in us, no spiritual life. Do you wonder why your religion is called? Your religion is like the 1904 Land Rover. Land Rover. The one you put in that thing and start cranking for it to start. Is a vital relationship. There is no life. Unless there is this mystical union. Remember, it is through faith. Not, not that you work for it. You don't. This joining to Jesus Christ is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing what our Savior Jesus Christ has accomplished for your soul. Believing the Lord Jesus Christ dying for you. Taking your place. In that belief. The Lord makes us alive. And we have this union. I ask as I close, dear friend. Do you think that you have this relationship? Like the branches with the vine. Or you are a branch on the ground, fit to wither and be bent. Bent in hell. The Lord help you to think through while there is still time. Amen. Amen. Ask that we...